All right, welcome everyone. We are here today with Greg Logan of OpenCast, and he'll be uh, chatting with us about tracking OpenCast's community, but how? All right, Greg, take it away. All right. So good morning, folks. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about OpenCast community and how we try and keep track of it and how we're looking to keep track of it going forward and how some, how some of that work to make our tracking systems better has brought up some questions about what is and isn't appropriate and how to handle telling the user what we're doing. So first, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a long-term developer. Um, by long-term, I mean I've been working with or on OpenCast for 13 years now. I'm a board member as of fairly recently. Um, not that yeah, long, long term, Olaf says. Um, not that I haven't been effectively on the board because the QA, co QA coordinator slash community manager, which is quite the mouthful um, role, has had me sitting on the board for a while. I haven't technically been a voting member, but effectively I have been because I've been on the board. Um, so that role, that QA, QA, QA coordinator community manager, it means that I have a very deep technical background in terms of how OpenCast works, how it's developed over time, but I have precious little to no educational background. Um, I did my grad degree in a lab specializing in um, e-learning type things, but I was very much more on the like technical development side and less on the talking to teachers and students side. I'm also a consultant within the OpenCast community, have been for years. Um, so I wear a great number of hats within the community, which gives me a great breadth of how the community is doing. But I don't work for any given institution, which means I don't really know in depth how anyone is actually doing. I just know the surface details. So OpenCast, for those of you who aren't aware of what OpenCast is and looking at the room here, uh, there's three of us from OpenCast and then the Perio staff. Uh, I'm going to just go through a brief overview here of what OpenCast is. It's an open lecture, content, open lecture content management system. It's a powerful video processing engine and it's an extensible self-hosted system. And I, I try, try to emphasize here the open source nature of things because realistically that's the big differentiator with OpenCast. We can do literally anything because if what we already do isn't good enough or isn't doing something that you need to do, you can build that. You can build it yourself. You can hire somebody to build it. You can ask the community and maybe somebody in the community will build it. Um, we've had several um, very successful crowdfunding initiatives within the community where we've raised tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of euros or whatever currency we're working in today. And it's worked really, really well to get big features built in relatively little time and with relatively little cost for any single institution. So that's not really what I'm here to talk to you today about. What I'm here to talk to you today about is how OpenCast is used and where and who. So the problem here is that OpenCast is used all over the world. We know that because of various and sundry metrics that we do keep track of but we don't really know who is actually using it. Um, and we don't really know how they're using it. We know, for example, that there is a power plant in Pakistan that is using OpenCast for something. We don't know what, because it doesn't seem like an obvious use case for OpenCast, um, but we know that they're there. We'd like to know more about that. We'd like to know if they're still using OpenCast because we don't really even know that. And that's where, we had some, we added some user tracking stuff and I'll talk about what a user means here in a second, but we, we were decided that we needed to do it better. And that's where some of these questions came from. So quick definition before we go any further, what is a user? When you hear me say user or adopter, I am not talking about your students as an institution. So if you're the university of somewhere, I don't care about your students. I don't really want to know anything about them aside from roughly how many there are. What we, when I say user or adopter, I mean the institution of somewhere, that as a group, not your students. So that's the kind of thousand foot detail that we're looking for. We're not looking for individual people. 
we're looking for the group, the company level type thing that we want to know a little bit more about. And I think we've struck a balance of reasonable uh, without being too invasive. So the current state, if you were to download OpenCast right now, um, that we have, we keep track of things sort of four different ways. And I see now that I read this, I did not actually, <laughs> there was a point here that I tried to add and then I clearly did not recompile these slides. So we know a little bit more. There's the self-reporting community surveys type thing where we go to the users list, we go to chat, we go to wherever and say, hey, who's using OpenCast? How are you using it? What are you using? And sometimes we get things back and sometimes we don't. It's really tough. We can also look at conference attendance, obviously things like, you know, if you go to open Aperio, if you go to our conferences, you're probably interested, at least tangentially, in OpenCast. But what does that actually tell us? We can also look at the users list email addresses. We have, I think, something like a thousand people on the users list, um, but half of them have an at gmail.com. So that's kind of difficult. And then we can data mine the package repository IPs. So we have a package repository. We make our software downloadable via pack, like your, your traditional Debian packages or your uh, Red Hat packages. And we can look at how who's accessing them, what's where they're coming from. Obviously, a lot of that has some drawbacks. The self-reporting is always, always, always out of date. We operate on a six-month release cycle. So we, we, we're releasing OpenCast 12 tomorrow. In December, OpenCast 12, bec it, well, tomorrow, OpenCast 12 becomes OpenCast's stable release. In December, OpenCast 12 becomes OpenCast's legacy release. And then come next July, so that would be or next June, rather, that would be June 2023, OpenCast 12 is no longer supported. So it's pretty common for a lot of our adopters to move up to a version and then want to stick with it for a while because it, it does. It imposes some costs on you in terms of downtime and in terms of upgrade time, staffing changes, that kind of thing, where you do have to spend a little bit to do an upgrade. So people stick with a given release for a while. And unfortunately, when we ask them, you know, hey, what version of OpenCast are you using? If they answer, that's a snapshot of right now. In six months, we don't know if they've upgraded. In a year, we don't know if they've upgraded. In a year and a half, we don't know if they're upgraded. And we can continue to bother them and get updated data from them. And sometimes we get that, but sometimes we don't. And it would be nice if we didn't have to bother them. There's no reason, this isn't some great secret that they're trying to hide from the world. They're busy, we're busy. Why doesn't the system just report that back? <clears throat> Sorry, um, conference attendance. Obviously, conference attendance is very pricey. Um, I know when I fly over to our conferences, which are almost always in the EU, it's pricey. Even for our EU developers, it can be pricey to get to a given conference. It's a lot of flying or travel for a two-day conference. And that, of course, leaves out all of the fun things like pandemics and geopolitics. Um, if you are traveling to the US from certain countries, you may or may not be able to do that right now. And you may or may not have been able to do that for years. And that conference attendance, it, it's, it's a strong indicator, but it's by no means a great indicator because it's, it's hard for a lot of people. Email addresses from the users list, obviously, they don't mean much. Um, I'm almost 100% certain that Google does not have an OpenCast instance inside of it. Um, they run YouTube for crying out loud. Why would they have an OpenCast install? If you need to host video and, you're, and you are Google, chances are you're using YouTube. Um, so the email address, in my mind, doesn't really tell us a lot um, because you can subscribe to a list and never use a piece of software. And the package repository is, sorry, I have a cat here howling at me now. The package repository is very noisy. Um, the, you, we can look at the logs in terms of like who has downloaded such and such a file. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, what they're downloading is the package indexes. So what is available in our repository, but they don't actually ever download the software. And even if they do download the software, that doesn't tell us the ongoing story of what they're doing. It doesn't tell them what, uh, what version they are currently running, if they're even running it. Maybe they downloaded, downloaded it and just never got around to installing it. So 
what is the goal here? What, what do we as a project want to know? We came up with a few goals. We want to know what version of OpenCast is in use, obviously. That's the biggest thing for us is that, I mean, if, if a six month window is not helpful, then maybe we need to change that. Um, we'd like to know who the user is, um, that the, the story of the, the, um, power plant in Pakistan, is that some guy just having fun setting it up on the biggest computer he has access to just to see how it goes, or are they using it for internal training purposes? We don't know. And having more data about the users would actually be kind of helpful in that regard. And it would also be nice to know how much OpenCast is in use. One of the frequent questions we get is um, how much OpenCast is in use. Just a second. Shoo. I thought I could get away with that, but apparently I can't. Um, how much OpenCast is in use? So, you know, do you have 10 recordings, 100 recordings, 10,000 recordings? Some of our adopters have a lot of recordings, and some of them have very few. Same thing with series. So this would be analogous to like a class, your computer science 100. How many of them do you have? Do you have 10 years worth of data? Do you have one year worth of data? It's not that we actually care what it is, but just having a general idea of you having 100,000 recordings and 5,000 series tells us things that might inform some decisions about some of the performance tuning that we have to do inside of our software. We'd also like to know about tenants, which um, tenants is an open cast term. I should have added that to the, the definition slide. A tenant would be akin to a college within a university. So your college of dentistry would be a tenant within your, the university of somewhere, right? There's the university of somewhere's dentistry school. That would be a tenant. Um, we'd like to know about rooms. How many, how many rooms do you have instrumented to record things in? And a rough idea of how many students or users you have, just because, again, if we are making decisions about how things scale, having a rough idea of what our adopting base is doing is important. It would also be nice to know roughly what hardware is involved. We have some adopters who have, you know, 128 gigabytes of memory on a given machine. And we also have adopters who have cobbled together their OpenCast production install using repurposed student lab computers. So we've got very little memory to work with. Both of those obviously inform a little bit of our decisions in terms of what we think is reasonable for our software to be able to do and how it performs. So the current state of things pre 2020, pre today, basically, I'm merging the changes today. Um, it, our terms of use, allow collection of most of the technical data. There's a few things that we missed. That's pretty normal. Uh, it allows collection of adopter biographical data. So like I am so, so and so from the university of such, such and such, but notably it does not allow us to link the two. Um, and I actually looked into how I would go about linking them anyway, just to see if I could do it. And the data that we were collecting or we would have been collecting wouldn't actually have, I, I, I couldn't go backwards. I couldn't do it anyway. So, um, and this is also beside the point, but we weren't actually collecting it because we never got around to deploying the collection server. So even if you had sent data in, it didn't matter because it wasn't collected anywhere. So we decided, okay, let's, let's fix this. Um, so I'm working on fixing the server side of things and on the terms of use side of things, we needed a new terms of use. So we obviously allows collection of all the technical data, all of the adopter data, it does allow us to link the two. And it clarifies a few things about how we store the data. And this is really where the, the meat and potatoes of this talk is coming from, because it brought up a lot of questions in, in, in internal discussions that I don't know if other open source projects have had, or, and I'm reasonably certain that um, closed source projects won't have had. So this took a lot of work. Um, not that there was a lot of continuous effort, but there was a lot of like, throw it to this person and then see what they say, and then it comes back, and then we have to throw it to someone else. Um, obviously, the first thing when you're dealing with legalese is talk to a lawyer, but who's? Um, I mean, there's we have a number of adopting institutions. We had one of them volunteer some lawyer time. The lawyer said, yeah, sure, that seems reasonable, but that's according to, in this case, EU law, presumably. But is that okay with US law? Whose law do we have to adhere to? I'm Canadian. I'm doing the changes. Are we doing it via Canadian law? 
So it, there was a lot of like, who, sh who do we need to ask? And we came to a point where we just, we came up with something that seemed reasonable and a lawyer seemed okay with it. So that's what we went with. We needed to outline a few things specifically for GDPR compliance rules, like where will the data be stored? I.e., is it in the US? Is it in the EU? For how long? Um, and this actually is both important for you as a user, because you might not want your data hit, kicking around forever. And for us, because we don't want to have to keep old data, right? If it's 10 years old, we don't care. It's out of date. And we also had to define who had access, but we also didn't want to tie our own hands. So we had to sort of thread the thread a fine line between being restrictive and protecting your data and being permissive and allowing us to do what we need to be able to do with the data. One of the things we would like to be able to do is share rough room numbers and rough student counts with um, third party capture vendors. We've got, you know, your Xtrons here, and this is not, I'm, I don't know who all we've talked about, talked with because we haven't gathered the data yet. Um, but I know in the past we have had vendors come forward like Extron, that kind of scale of vendor who have asked, you know, how many rooms can we expect to sell our doohickey 9,000? The answer has been, we don't really know because we don't, we don't have that data. And it would be nice to be able to give rough summaries. We're not going to say the university of such and such has four rooms. We're going to say, you know, we have this many adopters, we've got a thousand adopters, and here's the breakdown of the rooms in terms of your average, you know, like there's 20, 20 adopters with four rooms and 40 adopters with 100 rooms, that kind of thing. We want to be able to give that kind of summary where it's thoroughly anom <laughs> anonymized, um, but not be so permissive that we could actually just say, you know, you know, the University of so-and-so has four rooms instrumented. That's not a reasonable thing for us to release as far as we are concerned. And that, that is where the next slide comes in. And unfortunately, looking at the, looking at the people here, um, the OpenCast group is kind of, <laughs> we've all had this discussion already. So I was hoping that there'd be more people here and we could talk about things from an adopter perspective, because I, I'm a software developer. I work in OpenCast. I don't have a production OpenCast install. I can ask people in the community and I can get answers from people who are really active in the community and really trust us, know us, that kind of thing. But what I'd really like to know is from the people who don't really know what OpenCast is, haven't installed it, what's reasonable? As, as an adopter, have you considered what's being gathered by your systems? And that's really what this is. You, and, you take OpenCast and install it, it's yours. We have no access to it. This is not a hosted solution. It can be, but it's not if you take it and install it. And if you don't know what's being gathered, is it really your system? And let's say that there is data being gathered. And you, have you considered what's being done with it? Are they using it to market to you? Are they just keeping it in a big pile for fun? It's hard to know sometimes. And if they are doing things like selling, information about your institution, about your systems, are you okay with that? I mean, that's a question for you, not for me, because obviously I, my needs as a software developer are going to be very different than an institution of higher learning or any, any kind of institution. Opencast can be used outside of education, obviously. I'm just speaking to the nominal crowd here. What hard lines would you draw? What, what isn't okay? Obviously, I personally, if I were in your shoes, I would say, I don't want you gathering like detailed biographical data about my students. That's none of your business. And I, as, as the person writing this tool, I completely agree. I want nothing to do with your student data, but I can see your, you know, I'm thinking here of specific vendors who would be our competition that I don't want to name. I don't know what they're doing. They might be, and that wouldn't be cool in my mind. Would you like to see a sample of what's being gathered? We collect, you know, this data. Do you want to see it, be able to see what exactly we're sending? Right now, you can't. But honestly, as I was going through and building it, I think that's a reasonable request. I mean, I'm getting, I, as OpenCast, am getting information from you. I think it's pretty reasonable that you might want to see what you're sending me. 
And what, if anything, would you want to know about other users? We've got, you know, a, a whole bunch of adopting institutions in OpenCast. Do you want to know anything about the other institutions? Do you care? Does that inform any of your decisions? That might inform some of OpenCast's decisions in terms of what kind of summaries to release, that kind of thing. I mean, we would like to be able to, at our conference, go, you know, hey, we've got this many adopters and we've got this many more over the last 12 months and give some summaries. And maybe that would be interesting for the community. I think within OpenCast, it would be interesting to our community, but I mean, it could also be used for things like marketing that, you know, here's an Aperio press release about OpenCast and all of its growth over the last year. There's all kinds of things that people might be interested in or might not be. It might not be relevant at all to anyone outside of OpenCast. And it's really, really hard to tell that from inside the OpenCast bubble. So. Uh, hi, hi, Greg. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, don't, I, I think you don't see the chat, but uh, I put a question in there. <laughs> Um, this is all very interesting, and we are always discussing this with the Zerdi community, uh, exactly the same, and uh, hey, what can we do, and we like to know this, and uh, um, I'm uh, I'm curious if you want to share your uh, what you found out in your search, what, we, what you can do, what you can't do um, with us as a community, as a Zerdi community. So our... There hasn't been a great deal of discussion with the community yet in terms of what's being allowed. I mean, I think back in the day when this was very first um, proposed, and this was quite a few years ago now, there was probably some, some questions asked of the community. The unfortunate fact is that lots of our, <laughs> when, that kind of when that kind of question gets raised but in our community, you have a few people that respond with, yeah, that sounds great. Whatever you said, sounds reasonable because honestly, I found our communities, it, our development community is pretty reasonable in terms of what we're asking for. None of us are in it for the money. We're not, um, I mean, I don't wanna throw Longsight under the bus here because I think Longsight's a great company, but like, we're not there to make money. We're all supporting our own institutions. We're not there as a consulting company. There's a couple of consulting companies in the in the community, but they're mainly tied up with just supporting institutions. We're not, for example, running our own hosting systems. Um, so it, it's kind of I don't know the answer to your question. I guess is what I'm trying to trying to spit out. Um, we didn't really get a ton of response back back in the day, and that's sort of normal within OpenCast. I tried to raise this with the adopting community and I didn't get any response back at all. Um, so that in, in OpenCast speak, that is broad community acceptance. We operate on a silent consensus principle where you know if somebody says something on list, hey, we're going to do this and no one responds, then that is taken to be, okay, yeah, that's fine, go ahead. Um, so we're not gathering, I mean, I can, well, let me see if I can pull up the pull request right now. We are Ooh, requests. Sorry if my clicky keys are loud, folks. We have a pull request at here, 3634. Um, and in there, the terms of use is listed. And we, we're not gathering anything too crazy, right? I mean, it's just the summary type data. Let me see if I can find the actual terms of use. Nope, not that one. That one. And then I want to see the raw file. Can I do that? View file. Yeah, there we go. So this is HTML, but the the, uh, the text is still there and, and fairly legible, I hope. <laughs> um, so we're not we're not gathering anything too crazy. Um, Having Francois, Francois is um, saying that he would like to know the average in terms of usage, minimums in terms of specs, and maximums in terms of proven proven scalability. Yeah, that sounds. I mean, that if I was coming up with metrics that I would want, um, the only one there that I wouldn't have come up with was maximums in terms of proven scalability. That one is going to be very hard for us to to gather. But that is also something that 
in my mind would be akin to adopter success stories, which is something that we do do. Um, so what, what we have is large adopters that are active in the community, we'll approach them from time to time and say like, hey, can you give us a little bit of a blurb? Can you give us a little bit of summary in terms of how you're using OpenCast and what you're doing with it? Um, so that would probably, we'd be able to spit, or to spit that out as well. Minimums in terms of specs, um, yeah, I mean that we would be able to pull that out of the adopter data. I suspect that's, that's sort of two things, minimums in terms of specs for active production use and minimums in terms of specs for like a testing instance because OpenCast scales very nicely both up and down, but it depends very much on what your service level agreements are within your institution. So we've got some who have massive, massive files that are being recorded in, you know, 4K at 60 FPS, and it needs to all be processed in two hours. And we have some who are like, they've got a 24 hour turnaround time and they basically only got audio to process or audio and a small video. And it varies so dramatically in terms of what you need to do that it's really hard. And this has been something that I'm not dodging your question. This has been something that we as a project have been struggling with for years is what is the minimum spec for OpenCast? We can give you a rough idea, but without knowing more about your use case, it's hard to say that you need, you know, four cores and eight gigs of RAM and this much disk, disk space. Averages in terms of usage would definitely be something we'd be able to pull out of this data, I think. And that that would be nice to see because um, just reading through the uh, the list of things that we're gathering here, you know, you've got the number of jobs in your OpenCast system. So an in OpenCast job would be um, re-encoding a video or doing speech to text on the audio. So we'd be able to, in a given period of time, say that there are this many jobs. So, you know, you've got this much usage in terms of backend processing. We might have a harder time being able to see what the students are doing. And to a certain extent, that's deliberate. Um, we want to know, we, we, for instance, we are gathering the total duration of all of the OpenCast, all of the videos in your system. But what we're not doing is gathering what your students are doing with that. We're not gathering how much video they're watching. That is something that is your business and something that you can gather. There's absolutely tooling within the system to do that, but we're not pulling the data in. I was really hoping there'd be more people here to uh, have a more lively discussion. I thought I had a whole bunch of discussion points here and it's tough to get ideas bouncing around when you've only got a few people talking. It is. It is. Well, we, we do thank you, Greg, for your time and for this information. Um, we are just about at the end of the allotted time for the session. So I think we're okay. And um, good news, we've recorded this. So hopefully folks will read it, or read it, <laughs> watch it after, uh, after the conference and um, can reach out to you if they have questions or thoughts. Yep, for sure. And by all means, um, yeah, if, if you are watching this video in the future, and have thoughts or questions, you can reach out directly to me or you can reach out to the OpenCast users list. And uh, yeah, we'll be here. Very good.